Here we will show the steps involved in our particular algorithmic implementation of the theory of energy constrained proportional betting. We call it the Ergodic Information Harvesting of Information, or EIH, algorithm. The algorithm and this video builds on our 2016 paper in the IEEE Transactions of Robotics and its supplementary video. We will explain the steps of the algorithm in the context of its application to a bio-inspired robot. Here's the robot, which we call the sensor pod, as it moves around a black plastic sphere in our laboratory. The sensor pod uses the same principle of sensing as a group of freshwater fish called weakly electric fish. These fish emit a weak electric field which enables them to hunt and navigate in the dark by sensing the field distortions caused by objects that enter their electric field. Here is the sensor pod detecting distortions to its self-generated field caused by the black plastic ball in the tank. The way ElectroSense functions is very different from any sensory modality you are familiar with. So let's look at how it works. Here's a simulation of our sensor pod where for convenience we've made the robot stationary while an object flies by it, so we can more easily focus on how the field is being distorted. But this is exactly equivalent to the ball being stationary as the robot moves, as we showed earlier and will return to afterwards. The black lines indicate places of equal voltage within the field, spaced 10 millivolts apart. Current flows along lines that run perpendicular to these lines. The heavy black line is at the 500 millivolt point. With no object around the pod, you can think of what the pod sees as a simple voltage divider. Each resistor has equal value, so there's no difference in potential between nodes A and B, which are both at the 500 millivolt ISO line. Now suppose a large plastic ball comes by like this. Current is flowing from right to left and now the resistance between node B and ground is increased because the current has to flow around the plastic ball, which has a higher resistance than the surrounding water. You can see the 500 millivolt ISO line near B has shifted to the left, and now B is sitting at a potential of nearly 25 millivolts higher than A. So A minus B is approximately minus 25 millivolts as shown. Here's the complete flyby. Here we see a schematic view from above of the sensor pod in gray. Near the center of the sensor pod, shown with a green dot, you see a blue dot at the top edge and one on the bottom edge representing a pair of sensors, metal electrodes that can detect perturbations in the field. For the purpose of this video, we look at data from this sensor pair alone. As the robot moves through the tank, it records distortions in the emitted electric field caused by objects in the tank. We subtract the top electrode voltage reading from the bottom electrode voltage reading. We restrict motions to be in the plane without rotation. This just makes it simpler to visualize what's going on. The large black dot represents a spherical plastic ball, two and a half centimeters in diameter, placed a little bit below the robot in the water tank so that there's no collisions. By measuring the voltage difference between our two electrodes and associating the measurement with the coordinate of the center of the robot at the time of the measurement, we can generate a heat map of voltage values representing how the target looks to the robot from any point within the plane, which is the observation model for the plastic sphere. Here's the robot going back and forth through the space. The color of the center dot represents a voltage of the bottom electrode minus the top electrode according to the color map. Let's freeze the robot for a moment to remind ourselves of what the voltage reading should be at this point. Current is flowing from the right field emitter to the left. The resistance from the bottom sensor to the left ground pole of the emitter will increase due to the presence of the plastic ball which is blocking some of the current lines. The top sensor also changes, but not as much. So the bottom sensor voltage minus the top sensor voltage is positive or yellow. The observation model we have represented here is for the plastic ball in the location shown. If the ball were in a different location, such as here, 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 or here, 
the values across the map would change correspondingly. Notice how the sensor can obtain similar voltage readings at different places within the tank. For example, if 0.1 millivolts is recorded, that corresponds to the orange color on the heat map. And there are many locations in space that could give that reading, especially once you include the noise and resolution of the sensor. The observation model shown here is both nonlinear and non-unique. Here is an example of a trajectory generated by the EIH algorithm for the sensor pod looking for a sphere with the observation model we just showed you. On the right, you can see how what is termed the belief, representing the likelihood of the object being at any particular point in the space, evolves as the trajectory proceeds along. The trajectory generated minimizes the weighted sum of A, the ergodic metric, and B, the square norm of the control effort. In the context of our assumed dynamics, the square norm of the control is the total kinetic energy required to execute the new trajectory. To understand EIH, we begin with the sensor pod making measurements as it follows the trajectory shown around our plastic ball, whose location is not yet known, but which we show here, along with the corresponding observation model to facilitate understanding. The initial trajectory generated by EIH is based on a uniform and flat distribution for the initial belief regarding the location of an object in the space. The default mode of EIH in such cases is to scan across the majority of the workspace, and it's easy to understand why. An ergodic trajectory samples space proportionate to the expected information. Since that is equal in all parts of the workspace, this results in a trajectory that tries to maximize coverage of the space while at the same time limiting the energy expended on moving through the space. The voltage measurements along this trajectory are shown along the bottom, consistent with the observation model. Now, let's suppose you believe the sphere is in one of the four colored locations shown in this animation. The black dot is the actual location of the object, which is not known to the sensor pod. As the sensor pod moves, it collects measurements, shown as the black noisy line. Along with those measurements, we show what the sensor pod would measure, neglecting noise, if the object was located at each of the colored locations. As you would expect, the magenta line is very similar to our actual measurements, since the magenta's location is close to the actual object location, well, the cyan line, for example, is very dissimilar because the cyan guess is very far away from the actual object's location. As the measured voltage for each of the four possible locations is more similar to what would be expected if that were the actual object location, the probability of the object being in that location increases, shown in the histogram to the right. Object 3 is the probability of the target being at the magenta dot, so that histogram bar goes up pretty high. Instead of guessing only four possible locations for our target, we can perform the preceding calculations with the expectation that the object is at any of a dense grid of possible locations. This is like our prior step, but with a histogram for every possible position within the space. Now we are able to compute the probability that our object is at any particular point in the space, or the belief as we defined earlier. In this case, the algorithm terminates when the variance of belief, the inverse of the histogram bar height, for a location goes below a certain threshold. This is biologically relevant as the variance corresponds to how confident we are in our belief. For example, in the context of prey capture, a predator might want to stop gathering sensory information once the variance for the target's location is below the width of its mouth. After one pass through the space, we can see that the variance is not yet dipped below our threshold, so we need to explore the space further. But how do we explore the space in an optimally informative way, given the knowledge we have so far acquired? With the current belief, we should be able to use our observation model to guide our decision as to where to explore next. To motivate that idea, 
consider the gradients of the observation model along the x and y directions as shown here. It's intuitive that we should make observations where the gradient changes most rapidly, because in those locations, small changes in the trajectory of the robot results in big differences in the observations and allows us to rule out correspondingly more possible locations that the target could be. Moving the robot in locations where the gradient barely changes does not gain much information, so our trajectory planner should avoid those locations. Similar to our point about not putting our eyeball directly on a word we're trying to find, notice that if we move the sensor to the peak of our belief, that would position it right above the ball. And the observation model shows that this is one of the worst possible locations of all to put the sensor. The voltage is zero there, and there's a large number of possible locations the object could be given that sensor reading. We can approximate the quantified information value of locations within our observation model by looking at the spatial derivative of the model along the two directions of movement, as shown here. We can combine these two spatial derivatives to estimate the expected informativeness of sensing locations in the coordinate frame of the sensor. After some more manipulation, this gives us the sensor fixed fissure information rather than the entropy as used in the study. But the results are nearly identical regardless of the information measure used. And it's just slightly more straightforward to use fissure information for this video. Here's what the computed sensor fixed fissure information looks like for our electric fish inspired sensor pod. If the object is actually located in the center of this plot, then this also shows what the expected information density is for all the sensing locations around the object. Information about the position of our target is highest at the four bright lobes, so our sensor should sample there. The blind spot is in the center of the sensor, as we mentioned earlier, where there's a black hole right in between those four lobes. In the next step, we're going to show you how to combine the sensor fixed fissure information with the belief, returning to our simplified case of there being four guesses for the actual location of the target. The EID can now be computed by shifting the sensor fixed fissure information for one object to each expected location and then scaling the information magnitude according to the probability that the object is in that location. So the sensor fixed fissure information for the magenta location gets scaled by nearly a factor of one, while the sensor fixed fissure information for the cyan location by only a small fraction of one. As before, we can generalize this step and imagine shifting and scaling the sensor-fixed fissure information for all possible locations within the space, as shown here, to get a complete expected information density map for our space. Finally, this EID is used to synthesize an ergodic trajectory. Remember, a trajectory is ergodic if it samples a region of space proportionate to the measure of information in that space. So this trajectory samples the EID proportionate to the value of the EID across all locations in the space. Here we show the iterative evolution of the ergodic trajectory for a single EID. At each iteration of the optimization, the optimizer tries to minimize the weighted sum of the ergodic measure and the control cost, which is effectively the kinetic energy of movement. This balances ergodicity with the cost of movement. After this, we're only going to show you the final optimal trajectory for a given EID. Here is an optimal trajectory generated for the EID shown. I'll end this explainer by showing all of these steps together, starting with no knowledge of the location of the object. So we begin with a belief that all locations in the space are equally probable. We will iterate until we have localized the object with our desired degree of confidence. 
EIH generates trajectories that can either be used to test predictions of animal sensing behavior or to guide a robot that is collecting information. It provides a unifying explanation for many enigmatic motions of sensory organs that have been previously measured. As discussed briefly in the paper and supplement, it also organically generates the transition between exploration and exploitation, and vice versa, rather than needing that switch to be explicitly specified. Finally, it provides a bridge between the literature on animal movement and energetics and information theory-based approaches to sensing.